Ugh, fly to Jesus and live. Come to Jesus and live. Christ definitely is the center and the reason why we have our life, why we move and live and have our being is because of him. He is our great hope. He is our great promise. He is our, he is the bright and morning star. He is with us forever. I'll be with you even to the ends of the age. His promise is true. He is our Christ. And today I hope that you would fall deeper in love with him. You already do love him. And that you would come to him today if you have not done so already. We'll have opportunity for that. We're going to have a special time of prayer at the end of the service today for multiple things, that being one of them. Aren't you grateful for our choir? Grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Grateful for our kids' workers who are busy down there as well, and grateful for each other. Hopefully you're coming in this place uh, ready to, um, to, to give to other people, ready to connect to the Lord, also ready to receive. And I know we come into this building with lots going on. Uh, this morning you might have just dragged yourself here. Perhaps you're at home and you're, you're there because of various reasons, be it physical reasons or distance. And we're here, and some of us are here full, just overflowing. And we celebrate with you. Some of us are here today um, <laughs> running on empty or less than empty. And we want you to be encouraged and look forward to connect with you in prayer. And many of us are, are in between where we have some things, of course, that we can be grateful for. I think we all have those. And we have some burdens that are on our mind or in our heart. And so the prayer is that we would indeed come to Christ and rejoice with one another, pray for one another and receive from him and give to one another. We ask God his grace for that as well. Our series is um, called Life Together. And this series, the primary focus is on what this is that God is doing among us, what the church is, what his calling for the church is, and what our place in it is, so that we can understand what this is all about. More than, so this is what we do because I grew up going to church or we think it's a good idea. But to see biblically what God's will is and what God's desire is for the church and in the church. So last week we focused on three primary things the church does. And this is straight from Ephesians chapter 1. And today, yes, we are going to Ephesians chapter 4. And so the first thing collectively, we are called out. The church is called out from all of the people in the world and then called together. And we do primarily three things. We, number one, display God's grace. This is review from last week. We display God's grace. His grace among us and in us and through us. Second, we display together God's wisdom and connecting people throughout the world. And it was beautiful, just displayed in front of us today. Different colors and different backgrounds and different ages and different voices coming together. That's God's wisdom, to unify people inside of himself, not just in local congregations, but throughout the world, as different languages and time zones and times in history. That's part of God's wisdom displayed in the church. And ultimately... And thirdly, to display God's glory, that we would praise him as we have been doing today, as we enjoy him, as we testify about him, as we see his work among us. This is what God does in the church, and we are a part of that. This is our high calling, and this is what Christ is doing among us. This is why we gave some time for testimony. This is Christ's work. So none of us, no personality, no pastor, no power, no position, no organization gets the glory, but this is what Christ is doing. And I think all of us would like to be a part of a church that does that, displays God's grace, displays God's wisdom, displays God's glory. It's helpful for us, it's beneficial to our families, it blesses our community, and it changes cultures. And this is what God does to the church, and it is precious to him. And I hope that we would see his work and hold it as precious among ourselves. 
So knowing that this is God's target for his church from Scripture, we have to ask ourselves a question, and I'm asking you a question. So if that's the goal, to display God's grace, his wisdom, and his glory, how do you do that? How do we see that among us? How would you, if you were thinking about uh, a church, what would you instruct people to do? How would you pray? What would you say? And what elements would you think would be essential for that to happen? Because it doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen by accident. What would you make sure was displayed in the church? Well, the good news is, as you're thinking about that, we get that instruction. Again, when you read, especially the letters, these are the epistles that are called, primarily written by the missionary Apostle Paul, you'll see in the book of Galatians and uh, Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and other books that he wrote, that the first half of the book, roughly, talks about theological truths. And in the book of Ephesians, there are some powerful and profound prayers in the first few chapters. And I would encourage you to read them. I would encourage you to listen to them. I would encourage you to pray them. And what Paul prays is from the Holy Spirit himself. And it's a pray for that church, but it's a pray for, prayer for this church as well. And then in chapter 4, we read some words now built upon this foundation of what God is doing through his grace and his wisdom for his glory, knowing that the Holy Spirit helps us in this, right? Nothing that we have to manufacture or try to drum up within ourselves. It's about relying on his spirit working among us. Then he tells us a few things and starts this way, walk in a manner Worthy of the calling in which you have been called. I, therefore, this is what he says, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the manner of the calling to which you have been called. So we have to understand a little background to this statement. I, therefore, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, a prisoner for the Lord. Paul, when he was writing this book, and many of his books, wasn't doing so in a nice luxury resort on the side of the Mediterranean Sea, sipping a tall, cool drink. If you look at his life, it was one of sacrifice, it was one of service, it was one of suffering. Paul knew the glory of the gospel, and in his heart there was a desperate love to convey who Jesus was to the nations, that he went and he served and he suffered. So, with this opening statement, first we have to recognize that walking a life worthy of the calling does not equate mansions and Lamborghinis and cash flow. Someone wants to sell you that today? Okay, American Airways put that out. If you look and compare that message with the message that we see in the New Testament what we hear in the Gospels, what we read about in the Old Testament. Often, living a life worthy of the calling means that it won't always be easy. It's going to be good and it'll be worth it. But it does not guarantee you that you will have no trials. Paul could have chosen not to admit that Jesus was the Messiah. You recognize that what he gave up. Paul grew up with a pedigree. He was intellectually sharp. He went to the best school of his day. 
We equate that to our day. He went to an Ivy League school, so to speak, full-ride scholarship to Harvard, per se, or Yale. He had a very bright future, educated by the very best, a part of the ruling Sanhedrin, or body of Israel. And Paul, in his recognition that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, saying that, ostracized from all of those that, that he wanted to be esteemed with, set aside or, or changed his education, changed the whole trajectory of his life because he believed the truth about Jesus. When you believe about the tr- truth about Jesus, that we talked about that a few weeks ago, it changes you. Changes you. Church is built on the recognition of who Jesus is. He is indeed God in the flesh. He is the balance between truth and grace. It's God's perfection. Love meeting and fulfilling justice for our sins. Once that revelation comes to you, you are changed. This happened to the Apostle Paul. He was heading one direction. He thought in the name of God persecuting Christ. People, by the way, do that this day. In the name of who they think is God persecute Christ in this church. Paul encountered Christ. He was changed forever. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, he says pastorally, he says apostolically, he says by the Holy Spirit, I urge you, no one can force you to follow Jesus. You have to choose this. And we choose this based upon the truth of what we know of him, the pearl of great price, the ultimate king, the one who loves us truly and fully. Paul says in light of this, hey, now I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And this term, walk in the manner, means, like, you guys remember those um, old scales, you know, you would put weight on one side and you balance it out, okay? That's how they weighed things back in their day. And you still see those on rare occasion these days. But this word means, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, that our calling, the weight of our calling, as a church, to display God's grace, to display God's wisdom, to display God's glory, that the weight of that calling would be equal to walking in a manner worthy of how we live, so there would be balance between them. This is what this means, and if you read the book of Ephesians, I encourage you to be doing, in particular for this series, you'll see this word walk, which just means live, put these things into practice five times in the remainder of this passage. So our call is to know this stuff, but better stated, and rightly so, to embody these truths. Embody these truths. The world does not need more people who know about the gospel. The world needs more people who live the gospel. That's what this means. And so we all desire, the world honestly longs for a community that is full of grace, Community that bridges gaps and divides. A 
community that has the Spirit of God working in it. That is healing, attractive. It's worth giving ourselves for. And that's the invitation. But with that invitation, there is a, a code or responsibility and urging from this passage to now live the truth and walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I have been called. And then he starts to tell us a few things of what we are called to display. And these words have weight. And if you look at them, these words need the Spirit of God to work them in us. These are the attributes of people who are a part of the church that we would live this way. Verse 2. We're just going to go to 2 and 3, and that's it for today. With all humility, gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace with all humility which means now walk in humility. Be a person who, when you interact with others, it's done so in a humble way. Now what helps us to be humble is understanding that we are who we are because of the grace of you see how that connects? Display his grace. And so if that's the case, then we have to understand it's his grace we are saved. <laughs> God in his grace has given you your talents, whatever they are. God in his grace given you your abilities. He has gifted you. God in his grace <laughs> gave us bodies that heal God in his grace gave us this planet, our salvation, our forgiveness. He gave us eternity. God in his grace will resurrect those who are in Christ. And helping you and I with humility is understanding the depth of God's grace to you. The brightest star and the strongest football player, if you're into football, watching this afternoon perhaps, or the strongest singer or the most intellectual uh, academic. They have their talents, their abilities, even this planet because of God's grace. So we need to, um, let's see, we must have a deeper recognition of God's grace. And once you get a hold of that, you display humility. And humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. I'm not saying, well, to be humble, you have to downplay your talent. What it means is you don't think about yourself all the time, but you think more of others and more of God. Hear that. There's a false humility. I'm not saying that. Be confident in what is God, God has done, but recognizing God has done it. Humility, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. 
and thinking more of others. Now the opposite of humility is pride, and pride, pride is problematic because it now places people in competition with each other, with a false ranking system. I remember in high school that uh, I was desperate for affirmation, I was desperate for love, and I thought as the world thinks, in order for myself to have value, I must accomplish things. And so I worked hard. You would have not seen anyone who tried, well, I can't say it that fully, but I tried hard, okay? And I was involved in one thing after another, from three different sports to academic honor rolls to choirs and to bands and to student government and on and on and on and on and on. And I did that not to display God's glory. I did it to try to get glory to me. I wanted people to see how great I was. And when I failed at something, if I got a third place ribbon instead of a first place ribbon, I felt I was worthless. The wrong way of thinking. My value was based upon what I accomplished versus what God said about me. I came to Christ, he started to heal me and tell me my value is not in how I perform, but what he's done. Changed. Now I interacted with people and loved people to a degree that Christ loved them. And not, I'm not trying to highlight myself here. Okay, hear me. This is just an example. Why is that? Because of his grace and to, true humility comes from security and security comes from knowing that your identity is centered in what God says about you and in his grace given to you. We don't rank people differently. We love all in Christ. Does our society rank people differently, by the way? 100%. Right? But if you understand God's grace, you love people indifferently. Regardless of their background, regardless of their bank account, regardless of their external beauty, humility must be active because of God's grace. This is how God asks us to live. First Peter five five tells us that God and this is a scary verse, opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Life is hard enough how it is. You do not want to be opposed by God. God says to the proud, well, if you think you got it, you think you're enough, go right ahead. Without his grace, we have a very short, wick, short rope, even a short life. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, God will give you, God will not give you more than you can handle. Anyone heard that phrase? I've said that phrase. God will not give you more than you can handle. It's a nice, comforting phrase. But it's not true. God will give you more than you can handle at times. Let me tell you how I can say that and why I say that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, with Paul in one of his missionary journeys and his companion. For we were so utterly burdened 
beyond our strength. That we despaired of life itself. Sometimes we are given things that are beyond your strength. Sometimes we are so overburdened and so desperate that we despair of life itself. Again, now who sang this? The Apostle Paul. He was not a weak man. If you are there and if you have been there, I want you to take hope. Verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. God at times brings us to the end of ourselves, so we'll learn to depend upon him. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You can't do it, but God can. These are the times that we turn to him in hope and recognition that we don't have what it takes, but he does. The one who never leaves us nor forsakes us. And those times when we are burdened beyond our strength, those are the times in which we call out to God so we understand that we cannot do it on our own. But there is a power and a source and a great grace that is far greater than our own. Paul continues in verse 8, He delivered us from such a deadly peril. Know that who delivered He, which is God, God delivered us from this deadly situation. And he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope. Where are you setting your hope? And our humility, and this is humility that says that we cannot and you cannot, but God is with you. He is for you. He is not against you. He has delivered you in the past, and He will help you in the future. So with God, you always have hope. Hope lifts. Hope changes. Hope opens a door and provides light in the darkest of situations. And I'm not asking you and telling you to hope in your own strength. I'm telling you to hope in the grace of God. This is what Scripture tells us. In verse 11, it says, You must help us by your prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. Prayer matters. Because it's directed to the God of hope. And the God of hope will help you in your weakness. Do you understand this? So God at times does give, does allow things in our life that are bigger than us. It is okay because he has not left you. And at those times it forces us to greatly call out to God for hope and do that and his grace will meet our burden which we could, which then elicits from us brings from us glory which causes us to give thanks to god and recognizes the limits of our humanity which helps us with humility do you understand how this works walk in humility god help us 
to understand God's grace and to be humble. It's attractive to God and it's attractive to others. Help us, God, to do this. Secondly, walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. Gentleness. Has anyone, like, patted you on the back and says, you're so gentle? Is, it, is this an attribute that we really esteem in our society? No, what we, what we esteem, strength, boldness, courage. You know what God esteems? Humility, gentleness. This is what gentleness is. It's not weakness. Gentleness is controlled strength. It's like when a parent is wrestling with their three-year-old. I can tell you I can out-wrestle any three-year-old on the planet. It's the truth. I know. It's hard to believe. I was wrestling with my kids. Right? You remember doing this when they were young? When you were young? <laughs> I could pick them up, but I didn't pick them up and throw them through the window. I didn't, like, you know, do a flying elbow from the top rope. Strength, right? I'm stronger than a three-year-old. Controls. They'd jump on my back, and I would grab them, and I would gently set them down. You remember this? That's gentleness. I'm not saying weakness. Gentleness. You have strength. Now, with that strength, control it. Be gentle. When we were first starting the church, I worked with a couple guys right there. Brian Bracken is one of them. Tom Conicky, our drummer, is one of them. They could kick my butt when it came to construction. I was a pastor with pastor hands, very smooth. They'd make fun of me for that. I wear gloves all the time. They had great strength, but they were very gentle with me. And then coached me along. Hey, Dave, do it this way. Hey, Dave, this is how you hold a hammer. No, the other end. Strength, controlled, helped me to grow. Gentle. The point is not to destroy not to display your strength. The point is to use your strength to benefit other people. You understand that? Do it in a way that is gentle. And all of us need your strength. You need to display it, yes, but in a way that helps others and passes along those Walk in humility, walk in gentleness, display that with one another. It keeps community and relationship. Bulldozers in the house of God. It's good for accomplishing things, but it can, we have to be careful. Gentle. Thirdly, We see this, again, looking over what the goal is to display God's grace, to display his wisdom, is in connecting the body together, display his glory, living a life worthy of the calling, walk in patience. Patience is a word that I hate. True, be real honest. I'll spin it uh, that makes myself look better. I'll say, I want to be efficient, so get out of my way. Right? That's what I do. I don't know what you do. That's what I do. <laughs> not saying it's right. Patient? Oh, I 
hate that. God, do your work in me. And biblical patience, by the way, is remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome. Trusting that God will deliver on his promise. Patience is an expression of faith. You know that? This song that I love, it's a little bit old by a guy named Jason Upton. Anyone here familiar with Jason Upton? That's me and you, buddy, and you. Okay, a few of us, right? Okay, got a thumbs up. Jason Upton. Uh, he sings a song uh, called, I think it's called, I Will Wait. But I will wait for you. Jesus. I will wait for you. We think of patience when it comes to each other, and it must be displayed, but it's also waiting on God. Some of the most precious places on the planet are in the waiting room. And some of you are in the waiting room right now. Waiting on God to help your children who are addicted to one thing or another. Waiting on God for your spouse. Waiting on God for the final healing of your body. And go on and on and on. If you literally have been in a um, doctor's waiting room, it's quite a, quite a place where people are waiting for to hear the report of the surgery for their loved one. They're waiting for a child who got in a car accident. There's waiting. There's lots of angst. There. So this patience is choosing or often being forced to wait, but remaining at peace while awaiting an outcome. This is the patience that Noah must have displayed waiting for the door of the ark to close. The patience that the water will indeed diminish. This is the patience of Daniel trusting in God. That he will be delivered from a den of hungry lives. This is the patience of Job between when his riches, his power, his family were taken away, between that time and the time where things were restored. in your situations, in circumstances, and irritations. Again, we don't live in a patient culture. But what if in the church that we display patience to one another? What if when we're standing in line... We were patient. That's not a natural tendency. So in order for us to display God's grace and his glory, we need humility to walk in it, gentleness, Lord, help us, patience, one another. This is how these things are displayed. And he takes another step, which, I would, which I'm calling long-suffering. Walk in long-suffering. Another word we don't like. 
This is in the verse, verse 3, bearing with one another in love. Because we love each other, we don't break off relationships over things that continually annoy us. If we're not long-suffering with others because of our love for them, our circle of friends will become very small. Because people can be annoying. They annoy us, but guess what? You probably annoy other people too. Got an amen over here. Is that directed at me, Mario? (laughs) Amen, brother. Now you're preaching. (laughs) We're so easily annoyed. It's pathetic. (laughs) Long-suffering is the exercise. I like this phrase. I read this in the commentary. I thought it was great. Long-suffering is the exercise of a largeness of soul that can endure annoyances and difficulties over a period of time. Let me say it one more time. Long-suffering is the exercise, that's the working out, of the largeness of soul that can endure (laughs) annoyances and difficulties over a period of time. So if you and I are easily annoyed, my recommendation that you would ask God to help enlarge your soul. For long-term relationships to continue going forward, we need to bear with one another in love. In doing this, we continue to connect because if you and I broke off relationships with everyone who annoyed us, you'd be living by yourself. And then after a while, you would get tired of your even yourself. Right? So the prayer is, God, help us to live, I love that phrase, with large souls. <laughs> right? God, help us to expand that. Long suffering. And lastly for today, walk in unity. This is the last part of the verse. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What are you most eager to maintain? Your health? Your income? Your comfort? Your position, your opinion. We as humans are eager to maintain a lot of things. (laughs) Let me me rephrase that. We as Christians are eager to maintain a lot of things that do not matter. You know what matters? The eager... To maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I've mentioned this in the past, but our country, if you haven't noticed, and churches are fracturing, dividing more now than ever. You can pick your poison because there's a lot to choose from. Over politics, over COVID, over race, over 
ministry ticket. Right? Eager to maintain the unity and the spirit and the bond of peace. You know how we can do that? Choose to emphasize the things we have in common. We're going to read about it next week in the next verses. There's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one hope, there's one glory. How many? What we have in common is greater than what separates us. And a miracle will be that in the same room we have differences of opinion. Oh, no. We love each other. We embrace each other. We choose to emphasize what we have in common over what we do not have in common. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. God, help us to do that. No, a burden that bears heavy on me and heavy on the church and heavy on church leaders is disunity brokenness. This is the church I attend, and this is the church I used to attend, and that's the church I used to used to attend, and that's the church I used to used to used to used to attend. And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Maybe the problem isn't with the church. Maybe the problem is with you. You're meddling now, Pastor. Granted, there are times in which the calling and grace of God, there are legitimate reasons to step away. I'm not saying, not making their space for that. But doing so in a way that is at peace with those and not... As you walk out the door, pulling the pin on the grenade. That's what we're talking about. The world knows how to be divided. <laughs> the world does not know how to be unified. We, the church, have an opportunity, because of what binds us together, to live this. Walk in unity. Like I said, these words are not easy. I want you to think about it. Live a life worthy of the calling in which you have been called to display God's grace, God's wisdom, God's glory, done so in walking in a manner worthy of the calling, which means, God, help us to be humble, help us to be patient, Help us to be gentle. Help us to be long-suffering. Help us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And we need God's grace for that. So this is what the Word calls us to do. And this is what I'm asking us to do. And if we do this, this place will have greater joy greater thanksgiving, greater glory to Christ. It'll be, the word, attractive, but also interactive with our community, redemptive, that's the word. Making a di difference in Rockford and throughout the world. <laughs> to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the people. And so, I'm going to pray for us. The musicians are going to come up, if you would, please. And like I mentioned in uh, the beginning, occasionally we're going to do this, and today is one of those days, that I'm going to pray for us generally, and then it will be a special time of prayer. But if you are here today, and in response to what's going on in your life, you have a special burden. 
And that could be, there's a gamut of things. And if you want to say, you know what, I want uh, prayer today. After I'm done praying, I'm going to invite you up here. And you can just kneel up here. Um, there's some spots here you can sit or sit up here, whatever you want to do. I'm not asking you to, to tell myself and others who will be praying for you. We're just going to go by and we'll pray for you. God, bless Jenny if Jenny's up here. and I'll, I'll pray for her. And we'll just go if you have a special burden. Or if you have something that you just want to thank God for and say, God, I just want to thank you for this. Come. Perhaps it would be in response to this message. Maybe you're like, convicted, right? God, I need some help with patience giving you an opportunity to do that. It doesn't mean if you don't come up here, you're not looking for prayer. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is this is an opportunity for just a special time of prayer, and we'll pray for you. So I'm going to pray, Jen, uh, I'm going to pray for all of us, and then I'm going to invite you to come, and then um, Rob's going to lead us in song, or two or three. And if you need to go, of course, you're free to go. <laughs> If you want to stay, you're, you're free to stay. So let's pray. God, as I look around this room for this vantage point, and I know there's others joining us in another, another room and houses, sometimes I wish that everyone could see what I can see from up here. God, there's faithful people here in this room <laughs> they come to early morning prayer meetings in their 90s who have given their life as missionaries who have kept in community with their spouse love and give God what a what a glorious life those who chose to band together with other, other church, other churches, because they want you to be glorified. God, this is incredible. And so we're walking with you in your word. We're being instructed by your spirit, God, to hear your voice calling us to things that are greater than us. We ask God, have your way among us here. In each of our hearts, God, and we need help, Lord, to be humble, gentle, patient. Have peace to be long suffering. God, we need your help. And so, God, I ask, Father, that your word would sink in our hearts today, and you would apply it to us and our spirit, and that. We would just go beyond knowing the gospel that we would live it and help us and glorify yourself in this place. And I ask, Father, as we go from this place and people come for special prayer this morning, God, we ask that you would meet them. It's not my prayer or prayer of anyone, God, but it's you, and we call on you because some people are in a place that they have been given more than they can handle. God, as we pray for each other, extend grace for each other, God, we ask that you would move specifically in situations today. So we give you praise again this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so two things are happening now. If you want to come forward with prayer, go ahead. I'll make it three things. If you need to go, do so. Um, quietly if you would and if you want to remain and talk great do it out there okay so now's the time if you need some prayer come on up and we'll sing and pray together